invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. So, as we've been going through the book of Jeremiah, I thought it might be a good time to stop, or rather the prayers of Jeremiah, and kind of review where we've been. Next week, uh, we'll be in chapter 20 as we wrap up this series, and uh, it ends on a hopeful note there. You kind of see a lot of hope in Jeremiah chapter 20 as the Lord begins his promise that he would be a warrior to him, and what an incredible passage that is. But as we begin, a few weeks ago, we titled this Heart Cry because we have the normal practice of prayer, but there are times instead of proactively praying, we're reactively crying out to God. It's a prayer, but it's a unique type of prayer. It's a biblical prayer uh, because Scripture is filled with heart cries. And it's an effective prayer because God hears those who cry out to him. We see this especially in the life of Jesus as people cry out to him. And we began that in Lamentations 3, banking on and depending on the faithfulness of God because his mercies are new every morning. And then looking at chapter 12, we saw that Jeremiah is in this incredible time we would call lament. And the lament is okay. God allows him to lament. God doesn't chastise him for lamenting because in the next chapter, chapter 15, what we saw is that as we're lamenting and going down that road of lament, we just have to make sure we don't take in some bad friends such as delusionment and bitterness and self-pity as we're going down that road. And road is a good metaphor because if God is leaving you in a moment where your heart is crying out to him, and you're on that road with God, you're always asking the same thing, and that is, are we there yet? Like, when is this gonna come to an end? And if it doesn't come to an end soon, then what rings in your mind is all these promises you've heard from God all your life. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll always be with you. All of that rings hollow unless there can come to some type of resolution, right? And we know in our hearts that while God does not protect us from suffering, he does protect us from wasted suffering. There's a reason, there's a purpose for it. But this, this morning, um, we're getting really to really the key point of all of this. And that is to realize what God has for us, the, the purpose, the end goal, all that can be extracted from the suffering that could be suffering that could be for our good and for his glory, rides on a choice we have to make. The choice is simply, are we going to lean into God? Or are we going to leave away from God? Are we going to thank him for what we don't understand? Or are we going to resent him for what he allowed? And then as a consequence, resist him. Now, to, to say that, that someone's in the middle of really hard suffering sounds hard and may even sound harsh. So I told this, somebody this morning, the sermon is almost like from a brother. Um, coming alongside and saying, look, uh, whatever God is doing and stirring in your life, you, you can't waste that. There's something good on the other side. As we said last week, if God is good and he is, then there's good on the other side, but we won't see it unless we get to the other side. But realizing that good depends upon this choice, and it's found in Jeremiah chapter 17. And so with your Bible open, let me read starting in verse 5. Here's the choice we have to make. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and like those who do not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places, the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man, on the other hand, who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So let's talk about these two choices. This is incredibly important for me, for you, for us as a church. Um, what God wants us to get out of um, your suffering, out of our crisis, is really contingent upon this choice. The choice is the cursed life or the blessed life. So let's talk about the cursed life first. Look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Now what does that mean? Well, the curse is on the person who when they're looking uh, to make decisions, what their allegiance is for, what their confidence is in, it's basically within themselves. They take counsel within themselves. Now, 
It's not bad to be wise. It's not bad to be confident. It's not bad even to trust your intuition. That's not the point. The issue is the heart. Look at it there. Whose heart turns away from the Lord. And it says, cursed is a man who's, who makes flesh his strength. And so the word strength there could be arm. So the idea is, is that the, the arm, in other words, the thing that's supposed to give us confidence and protect us, is all, all our trust is in that, is in our own flesh. And so the mind expresses dependence upon our own flesh and the heart follows it. And really this is it. The whole game is the mind. If our mind doesn't understand that we're dependent upon God and thinks instead we're independent, then our heart follows that. And our heart doesn't love God because it doesn't know that it really has a need for God. So crisis, as you know, has a way of stripping that away and helping us understand how deep our need is for God. Look at verse 9. We'll come back to verse 6 in a minute. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So somewhere at the heart of all of our sins is this overconfidence. You see that in Eve. She was told explicitly, don't eat of this fruit, but she rationalized that somehow maybe she was right and that the enemy was right and that God was wrong. And you look at David who made a decision for which God uh, forgave him, but uh, affected the rest of his life and the rest of the, the whole nation of Israel. And there was an overconfidence. He believed that he was the king and he could do what he wanted. And so this is described as the cursed life. A life that looks inwardly, makes decisions based on its own counsel, and trusts solely in itself. So, here is the blessed life on the other hand. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its root by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green. And if that sounds familiar, it sounds exactly like Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the wicked or does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So the cursed life is the person who trusts in their own counsel, and the blessed life is the person who puts his confidence in the Lord. Now, we've all at some times put our confidence in ourselves made decisions based upon, not upon God's word, but based upon what we thought was right in the moment. And so the word cursing is really a strong word. And so we may ask ourselves at some point, is that a permanent curse? Like in the, in the cartoon movies, like in the Disneyland type of movies, this curse that is on somebody, like in a fairy tale, is that, is that what this is? Something that's on them that can never be extracted. In the same way, if someone does turn to the Lord, does that blessing, is it permanent? Does it always exist? I think that's a really, really good question because I've depended upon my flesh at times. Does that mean my life is cursed? Well, take your Bible and look to Jeremiah chapter 18. Look at the next chapter. We just sang this song, um, have thine own way, Lord. Um, I'm the potter, you're the clay. And in chapter 18, Jeremiah goes down and he, he sees a potter who's working on clay. And the picture is one of sovereignty, right? God is sovereign. He's the potter. We're the clay. He can do whatever completely he wants to do in and of himself. But here's what God said to Jeremiah. Look at verse 5. This is Jeremiah 18 and verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done, declares the Lord. In other words, all of this is in my hand. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do. And if any time I declare concerning a nation or kingdom that I will build and plant it, and it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now just stop there. Think about what he just said. Back at verse 7. If I declare, in other words, this cursing, going back to verse 17, if I declare, look, judgment is coming, but this nation turns around, I'll relent. 
Uh, that can actually influence my decision, God is saying. What a profound thought. And then he says, on the other hand, if I've promised good and blessings to someone, and yet their heart is turned away from me, then, um, then I'm not going to honor that. In other words, I'm not going to honor that person whose heart is turned away from me. Now, we're not talking about the doctrine of eternal security and can we keep our salvation or lose our salvation. He's talking here uh, to God's people. So let's think about that in this context. God has made so many promises to us. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you from Deuteronomy 31. Uh, that he would always be there for us. And yet, at the same time, God does not bless the person who is taking counsel in themselves, who's living only at their own discretion. We would call this, Paul would later say in Galatians chapter 5, someone who's living by the flesh. So what happens there? If God gives a promise and yet we're walking by the flesh, how does God still honor that promise? Because he's not going to bless those that are walking in the flesh or living that cursed life. I think that's a really, really good question. And maybe the best illustration of that is in Jeremiah. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 21, I'm sorry, 29, and let's look at one of our favorite promises. This will help us understand what God is doing. So again, Jeremiah chapter 17, we just read, God will relent of bringing judgment for the person who repents, but the person who's blessed, but is not walking in obedience and repentance toward God, um, he will not bless. So here's the verse we quote often, we, we love this, we pray it over our children, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, let's go back and read this in its context, and it makes more sense. Look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So the promise that he was giving them was not going to be realized for decades. God was giving them a future, but it wasn't an immediate future. It was a hope, but it wasn't an immediate hope. And look at verse 12. After he gives that promise for future and hope, look at what he says. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, uh, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, those sound like hard words from God, especially verse 10, but listen to what God's saying. God's saying, look, um, after all this, you're in exile and you're going to be in exile for uh, a number of years. But after that, I'm going to come and I'm going to restore you. And I'm not just restoring you to keep my promise because I've kept my promise. I'm restoring you because verse 12 says, you're going to come to me and you're going to call to me and you're going to seek me. So in other words, what God is doing is, is he's keeping his promise. But when God ultimately keeps his promise, he can bless them because their hearts have changed. Now watch, Jeremiah is giving us in the whole big picture. Here's the big picture. God is bound to keep his promise. But the problem is he can't bless this nation because of all their idolatry. They're worshiping their foreign idols. Their hearts are turned to other things. So God, if you will, humanly speaking, has a problem. He made his promise to bless. He's got to bless. But at the same time, God can't bless people whose hearts are turned away from him. So what God's going to do? What God does is he leads them to a very, very difficult situation. And what happens on the other side of that is their hearts change. And so now God's in position to do everything he said he would do. He's going to keep his promise and he can keep his promise because they have now chosen the blessed life. So, again, back to where we started. If God is walking through something, there's a very critical moment or we have to decide whether we're going to yield to God or not. This is called brokenness, if you will. Brokenness is simply a posture where we see um, our sin as God sees it. And in seeing our sin as God sees it, we turn and, and we press into him. 
And, and down that path, on the fork of the road, down that path is everything God wanted to, to give us. Because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If something's broken, God can restore it. But God doesn't restore those who never feel like they need to be broken in the first place. So this is why we can't resent or resist God when he's walking us through a trial. Because if we'll yield to that in brokenness, then he can restore us. What a wonderful thing. The opposite of that is presumption. Where we presume, going back to chapter 17, that just because God uh, gave this promise to bless, we don't have to change our behavior whatsoever. And here we are people with God's promises, but they're not realized in our life because we're acting in presumption. So... Um, we know this as parents, right? You make a promise to a child whether they understand it or not. I'm going to provide for you all your life. I'm going to protect you in every conceivable way, and especially when they're young and infants. And it's even more strongly with girls. I don't know why. It just comes out in a dad. You want to do everything you can to protect them and provide for them. But that doesn't mean they're always going to make right choices, right? And it also doesn't mean that when they make those wrong choices, we're going to roll over and say, well, whatever, you act however you want, I'm going to keep my behavior the same. And we're going to keep that promise, but then we're going to lead and coach that heart, that child, so it's in a position to understand how this relationship works and why it's so important. This is what Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 5. It's why he said, blessed are those who mourn Blessed are those who poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. <laughs> that sounds awful. Why do they get a blessing? Well, because um, at that point you see your sin as God sees it. And you're, and you're broken. And on the other side of that brokenness is everything God wanted to teach you through that burden. So when brokenness is your present, oftentimes the burdens become in your past because you're getting to where God wants you to go. Back to Jeremiah chapter 17, we have to think about in this choice that we make, what do these choices mean for us? What is God asking me? What is he calling me to? If he's surfaced a sin in our life, we confess that. Someone we need to restore with or seek forgiveness from or offer forgiveness, we do that. Whatever God wants to do in our heart to bring that brokenness, we press into because we love him and we trust him. That's a definition of what it means to wait on him. Believing that he's got something good on the other side. So here's what this meant for Jeremiah. Look at verse 14. This is back to Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. He's confident of what God can do. Verse 15, behold, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. Verse 16, I have not run away from being your shepherd, nor have I desired the day of sickness. You know what came out of my lips, and it was before your face. And so when, God, when Jeremiah is, is crying out to God, he says, essentially, God, it's important to me. Do you understand that I've, I've kept doing what you've called me to do? It's very, very important. And... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have our prayer time uh, like normal. And after our prayer time, we will extend an, an invitation. So there will be ministers here at the front. And if God is calling you to, to join this church or maybe you want to profess faith in Christ, there will be ministers here as Stephen leads us in song that will be ready to receive you for any decision that you want to make. Maybe you want to give your heart and life to Christ. There will be ministers here uh, to meet you and to pray with you in that decision. But before you do that, let's enter into a time, like every week during the series we've done, of crying out to the Lord. And as we're crying out to the Lord, this is a very personal time because we're asking the Lord and I'm asking the Lord, Lord, may my brokenness before you be complete. Um, again... Maybe the worst thing that can happen through this is that we don't thoroughly appreciate and grapple with in our own minds what the Lord is doing in our hearts. And so let's go before the Lord now. If you want to come to this altar, you can. If you would, just find a place of prayer wherever you want to pray. And 
we're going to have uh, three cycles of prayer this morning, honesty, tenacity, and humility. And I'll pack those back as we go. But the first thing is just a prayer of honesty. So let's pray this prayer right now, quietly, each one of us. Lord, can you reveal to me any, any sin so that I can have the same opinion of it that you do? That's what brokenness is, just agreeing with God about our sin. And so that's our first cycle of prayer. Let's go to the Lord. Let's seek the Lord and say, Lord, reveal to me my heart. I want to be broken over my own sin. Let's pray. We're here before you, Lord, grappling with our own hearts. God, you know our hearts, you see it inside. Lord, Father, I pray that, Lord, starting with me and the leaders of our church, Father, would we agree with you about our own sin? And God, would we feel the way about it that you feel about it? Father God, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, may that brokenness be complete and thorough, Lord, so that everything you want to teach us from this moment, Lord, we're ready to receive in a humble posture before you, Father. So shifting from that prayer of, of honesty, brokenness. Let's pray a prayer of tenacity. And what I mean by this is a determined decision not to give up until God's work is thorough and complete in our lives. You say, well, how long is that going to be? We don't, that's where the faith comes in. We don't know. We're asking God to do a thorough work and a complete work in our hearts. We have a tenacity toward him and a tenacity toward others who need the gospel. So let's pray again, saying, Lord, uh, tenacity. We don't want to stop. We know we be relentless in pursuing you until you've done all in us that you want to do. Let's pray right now. Not walking from you, but walking to you. And so, Lord, I pray for each family, each mom and dad, each student, each child, grandparents, Lord, for all of us who've been here a little while or a long time, Father, in whatever condition uh, we're in spiritually, Lord, would you please, in Jesus' name, Father, make us tenacious and relentless. 
towards you. Father, may we run to you in the same way that you ran to us to seek us and to draw us to yourself. Finally, church, let's pray a prayer of humility. Which means everything we've talked about, a humble posture before God, but also means a humble posture before others in the hope that God would restore fellowship that's been broken. And so let's cry out to the Lord now, Lord, would you give us humility as we humble ourselves before you? you have father yet God sometimes we don't see ourselves like you see us we get independent of you Lord you know that God we know you resist the proud but you give grace to the humble and father we need your grace and so Lord I pray for each one of us and us as a body that Lord we would humble ourselves before you father Whatever you have for us, we don't know what that is. Lord, we want to be humble before you, Lord, and receive it. Father God, I pray, Lord, beyond the scope of things uh, we've talked about directly or indirectly this morning, God, for individual hearts of people who who are broken right now. And Father, it's hard to trust. It's so hard. God, I pray that you would give them the grace to carry on, Lord. Give them the grace to trust you. Lord, you would lead them. Your rod and your staff, Lord, would comfort them. And you'd leave them beside the still waters and provide everything they need. Father God, we love you. Pray this in Jesus' name.